Good evening. Good to see you in the uh, Wednesday night Bible study followed by prayer meeting. Facebook friend, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are here, grab your hymn book and turn to page 296. Page 296. And let's stand together and sing this wonderful song of follow on. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Follow, follow. I'll, I will follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I will follow on. And that's what the Christian life is all about. It's about following Christ. Whatever he lead us. Because he's never going to lead us to the wrong, wrong way or wrong path or wrong directions. He's trustworthy. So, but Jerry's going to lead us into this song. Think about the words. Follow on, page 296. First Samuel chapter 26, verses 13 through 25. First Samuel chapter 26, starting in verse 13 and on to verse 25, the last verse of that chapter. First Samuel chapter 26, verses 13 through 25. So there in 1 Samuel, in chapter 26, starting in verse 13, the word of the Lord reads, Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of an hill afar off, a great space being between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and 
the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel is come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Amen. Please be seated. All right, I want to continue the lesson on Wednesday night, 1 Samuel chapter 26. I know we don't have a, a Spanish translator. Do we know about Carmen, what time she's getting here? Oh, she's there, okay, praise the Lord, she's here. 1 Samuel 26. And we're going to finish up where we left off on 1 Samuel chapter 26 in verses 13 to 25, which is the last uh, verse of that chapter. David spared Saul again. And that, that was the title that I gave last Wednesday. So we're going to continue part two. David spared Saul. Again, I know we, Brother Jared prayed, but let's pray again. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We need your help, Lord. Without you, we can't do nothing, Lord. We're, Lord, we're defeated without you, Lord. We're weak vessels. We're frail human beings. We struggle with the flesh. Dear God, and we stumble. Uh, and many times we do what's, what's not pleasing to your sight, Lord. And we ask for cleansing. Lord, we want to please you. We're here to bring honor and glory to your name because you're a, you're a good God. You treat us well, Lord. And I pray that you would bless the message, Lord. Uh, bless the lesson, the truth that is behind this story. Uh, use me for your glory. Use Carmen. Uh, fill her with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to be a blessing, dear God. Let the message go out effectively, English and Spanish. We need, we need you, Lord. We need your presence. We invite your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, David realized that God has been moving in his life. He realized that God had been guiding his steps. He refuses to bring any harm to Saul. 
He refuses to kill Saul. And he spares Saul again, we see here. When he they had a chance two times to take his life. But he did it. He refused because he was trusting the Lord. He trusted God with his life. And he left the matter into God's hands. In 1 Samuel chapter 26, in verse 11, he said, The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointing. And in verse 10, he said, David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. So you see the point here? He's leaving it in God's hand. He had a chance twice. He said, I let God deal with him. I let God kill Saul. I let God stop him. I let God take care of the vengeance. And then he goes on, he says, as he says here in verse uh, 2, or his day should come to die, or he should descend into battle and perish. So David was convinced of Saul's end here. He was convinced that Saul's end would come in three ways. The first one is the Lord shall smite him. In other words, God will directly could take his life. I'm not going to do it. I'll let God do it. And, and of course, I, I'm thinking that he, he's reminded of Nabal. Remember Nabal? When God smoked him, God killed Nabal. God was the one that killed Nabal in, um, in, in um, 1 Samuel 25, verse 38. So he's reminded of that because uh, he was going to take vengeance on Nabal. And uh, because of his wife's intervention, he, he backed out, and, uh, and he's glad he did it because the Lord showed him that I'll take care of the vengeance. So that's why, so he knew that Saul's end could come in three ways. God could take care of him. God could take his life like he did to Nabal. Or he said, or his day should come to die. Or he could just die a natural death. And then the third way is, or he should descend into battle and perish. In other words, he or he would die in battle. In other words, he left the matter into God's hands. He trusted God with his life. He trusted God with his problems. He trusted God to fight his battles. So David came to a point in his life where he was not going to manipulate the situation. And I believe that's what many people do today. Many people do that today. They're trying to manipulate life, trying to get it their own way. But David refused to do that. David came to a point of maturity in his life, and he said, I'm going to trust the Lord. And he did. He did. Let's see what happens next in 1 Samuel. That's what we left off last Wednesday. But let's see what happens next in 1 Samuel chapter 26 in verse 13. And I want you to remember that at the end of verse 12, we started that last Wednesday that God was the one that caused a big sleep on Saul and his big army, 3,000 men, sleeping, a deep sleep. And God was the one that was behind that. And David saw that, and he went with uh, Abisha to where they were sleeping. And David took, the, uh, took Saul's, uh, uh, his spare, uh, from his bolster and the uh, cruise of water or, or the jug of water. So the deep sleep from the Lord was the Lord's way of showing that Saul's authority had been removed. And I think God was trying to give Saul some signs, some messages. I'm done with you, Saul. So accept it. So that, that deep sleep from the Lord, I believe it was the Lord's way of showing that Saul's authority had been removed, the spare that David, that God allowed David to take from Saul was a symbol of Saul's authority. It is as if they had stripped him of his authority. So God is giving Saul signs to accept that his authority as king has been removed, is over, accepted. Let your bitterness go. Let your hatred go and submit to my will. And of course, Saul kept ignoring those signs. 
He kept ignoring it. You know, I think many times God gave us signs. God gave us many warnings and reminders, and many times we're just like so. We get stubborn. We ignore the signs that God has given us. In fact, I was talking to Brother Jerry the other day when we were so with and I said, I believe God, you know, there's a lot of people that are uh, ignoring big mountains of warning that God gave them to be safe. I'm talking about mountains of messages after messages and warning and people's prayer and, 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 and the gospel track that they get and the invitation that they get to go to church and the people that knock on the door and they keep saying no to God. If they go to hell, it will be your fault. Don't blame nobody else but yourself because God gives many signs, many warnings. And I believe God has given so many signs and Saul kept ignoring the signs. Verse 23, the, verse 13, 1 Samuel 26, 13. Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great, a great space be, be, being between them. So we see here that David chose the top of a hill afar off so he could, uh, see his voice, so his voice could be heard at a distance. He chose a great distance just in case he needs to escape. Don't forget, Saul got a big army. He got 3,000 men with him, and, and David smart. He, he chose a big distance. The Bible doesn't tell him it was a great space between them on a hill to raise his boy and to wake him up, wake these people up. And uh, just in case Saul began to pursue him and his 3,000 men, he got to have a chance to escape. So verse 14 and David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner. Now, we know who Abner was, right? Abner was Saul's captain of the army. He was the lieutenant of the, of the army. He was the chief military leader. So he says there in verse 14, And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answer thou not, Abner. So it seems like He's calling Abner more than once. You think that he's calling him more than once, and, and, and I guess maybe Abner is still sleeping. He's still sleeping, and uh, uh, so David, we don't know how many times he attempted, but he's calling up Abner. Uh, but I want you to get the scene here. David, from a distance on the top of a hill, raised his voice to the army of Saul. It's a big army, 3,000 soldiers who are sleeping so he raised his voice so they could hear him particularly. He wants to get the attention of Abner because he was the general of the army. He was the captain of the army. He was the lieutenant of the army. He especially wanted to get Abner's attention. And look what, verse 14, Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? So obviously God wakes them up and allows Abner to hear David's voice and wakes up. So Abner wakes up and says, who, who, who's talking? Who's calling? Verse 15. And David said to Abner, Art thou, not thou a valiant man? Now, I don't know about you, but that is a, a definitely, that's definitely a challenge to Abner's manhood. That is definitely a challenge to Abner's manhood. I mean, He's really telling him, you're not a real man. Abner, you're not a real violent man. You're not a real chief military valiant man. You fail your duty to protect your king Saul. Look what he says, and who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy Lord. And, and of course, the one that he's talking about, that there was one that was going to kill you, and he was, he was uh, 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 passionate to do it, Abishai. You know, Abishai, he held them back. So it was not David here, the man that was going to destroy Saul. It was Abishai. He's reminding Abner. And then in verse 16, this thing is not good that thou hast done as the Lord liveth. You are worthy to die. Because you have not kept your master, the Lord's anointing. And now see where the king's spear is and the cruise of water that, that was at his bolster. So we see here that David is rebuking Abner publicly 
for his carelessness, for his negligence in protecting Saul. He's literally calling him a coward. I mean, not being a valiant man, he's calling him a coward who fell miserably as a chief military man to guard his king. I mean, I think about that, and David, see, he, he's like really challenging this Abner. He's not calling him a man. He's calling him a coward. And David was a, don't forget that David was a military man. He knows what it is to be on guard. And um, uh, specifically, when it comes to be on guard, you need to guard your king. You know, it's like the president of the United States. You ever seen the president of the United States when he got those uh, secret services men all around him? And they're, they look like they're ready. They're ready to, uh, to protect the president. They're armed. And they're ready. And you see them uh, with the president. Everywhere he goes, they're, the president's giving a speech, and they're there standing right by him looking around. And, um, well, you know, that's what uh, uh, Abner should have done. But instead, he fell asleep on duty. He, such negligence on Abner's part was horrible and even worthy of death. Abner had committed the unpardonable military crime. Failure on watch is punishable by death in the military. So we see here that David is intimidating Abner, telling him that he was worthy of death. Because he fell miserably. He slept when he's supposed to be on watch. He is sleeping on the job. You know, I was reading that, and, 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 and I know I shared this story with you a while back. I experienced something like that where I was at work on duty, and in South Plainfield, I was making a delivery with my, with my uh, 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 you know, the, the, the box truck. And, and I, 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 uh, I was unloading a pallet, a heavy pallet full of water, wa water bottles. It was filled to the top. It was super heavy. And I was unloading that pallet to deliver it to the construction workers of a PSNG in South Plainfield. And when I pulled it out, it was like a little hill. And I was by myself. When I was pulling it out, that I was trying to bring it out to the edge. Of course, I looked up the lift gate. Well, the Mike, you know about the lift gate of the, of the, of the box truck. And then I had it already, and I, was, I, I jacked it up, and I was trying to bring it in slowly, but the, because it was so heavy, it came full force on me, and I was trying to stop it because it was going to crush me. And I was able to, so what I did, I, I released the handle of the, of the pallet jack, Brother Mike, and he released it, and the pallet, heavy pallet fell, but it fell right in my left foot. Get, good thing I have steel toes. It's, better to, it's good to wear steel toe while you work. That really saved my toes. But the heavy pallet fell on my left uh, boot on my left foot, but I still, I was at the edge, I had no room, and I fell backwards, and I was dangling up in the air, upside down, twisted all up, my ankle was all twisted up, I was in severe, excruciating pain, and I was crying out, help, help, somebody help me, I thought my bones were going to explode, I, it's excruciating pain, I was all twisted up, think about it, you're like this, the pallet falls on, you know, you're standing like this, and then the pallet falls on your left, on your left foot, and you fall backwards, he, uh, upside down, all twisted up. My ankle twisted up with all my weight. And I was in severe, excruciating pain. I kept crying for help. And when I looked, there was a security guard right in front of me, facing me. And I'm trying to help me, security guard, help, help. No action. I could see that, I could see the shadow that's still somebody in the driver's side. And I kept screaming, help. And the security guard facing me, no action, no movement. I think I was struggling for about five minutes. I was praying, Lord, help me, Lord. I mean, I, Lord, I, 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 I was in excruciating pain. And then finally, after five minutes, there were some guys that heard me screaming. They came out of the trailers, and they rescued me. By God's grace, no broken bones. Uh, I was very bruised. And... Um, and I noticed, what, you know what happened? The security guard fell asleep. Fell asleep on the job. And that's what we see here with Abner. He's supposed to be on guard. 
but he fell asleep on the job. And David was rebuking him was, uh, for, for his negligence, for his carelessness. Abner was guilty of negligence. Abner was guilty of carelessness. But let me say this in application. How about us? How about us? Are we guilty of spiritual negligence? Are we guilty of spiritual negligence? Look, examine your heart tonight. You're the only one that can answer that question. Are we guilty of spiritual negligence? Are we guilty of spiritual carelessness in our walk with God? Are we? You know, the Bible tells us, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking who may devour. We have an enemy that can't stand our guts. We have an enemy that hates us and hates our God and hates Christianity, and he's going to attack you with full force because that's the way he's going to get back to God. Are we awake? Are we alert? Are we watching for the enemy's attacks? The Bible tells us the Apostle Paul was talking to Christians that were sleeping spiritually. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 verse, and verse 14, Wherefore, he said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now don't forget, here Paul is talking to saved people. He's not talking to unsaved people. He's talking to saved people that are sleeping spiritually. Are we sleeping spiritually? Are we like Abner? Are we sleeping spiritually? Are we neglecting our spiritual life? Are we neglecting our spiritual growth? Are we neglecting our spiritual maturity? Are we neglecting our spiritual life? Hey, are we neglecting our Bible reading? Did you read your Bible today? Did you read your Bible yesterday? Did you read your Bible the day before yesterday? Then you know you're guilty of negligence. Because God's people are supposed to be reading the Bibles every day. We're supposed to be feeding upon the Word of God every day to, to remain strong. Are we neglecting our, prayer, our Bible reading? Are we neglecting our prayer time? And I'm not talking about this prayer where you just pray before you eat. Or you just pray, Lord, bless me, I'm going to work. I'm talking about where you spend time alone with God with the Bible open, with the Bible, and you talk to God. You give at least God an hour a day. That, by the way, that, that will be the best hour you give God. That will be the best hour that you're going to spend throughout the day because when you spend that hour with God in Bible reading and prayer, you're growing spiritually, and you know what? You're going to have, your day's going to go better. Are you? Negligent in your spiritual life, your church attendance. Are we negligent in our tithes and offering? How about in, in our soul winning, in our witnesses? Are we negligent on that? Are we, you know, that's not just for the pastors to do. That's for the, the First Baptist Church, everybody here as members and as attenders of this church. If you're saved, you're, you're, you're commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ as your chief commander. Go preach the gospel to every creature. Are we negligent in that area? Are we negligent in that area? You know, Brother Jerry, you let us in that song last uh, Sunday, Have, I, not, have I, I Done My Best for Jesus. You know, we sang that song last, last Sunday. Have I done my best for Jesus? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? Who died upon the cruel tree? To think of his great sacrifice at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many are the laws that I have lifted? How many are the chains I have helped to free? The hours that I have wasted are so many, the hours that I have spent for Christ so few. Because of all my lack of love for Jesus, I wonder if his heart is breaking too. I wonder. I mean, we sing the song, but are we living it? Are we negligent in our spiritual life? Are we witnessing? When was the last time you gave a gospel track? When was the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus? When was the last time you invited somebody to church? You know, it's teamwork. This is teamwork, amen? 
When was the last time you invited somebody to church? You know, I'm doing my part. I'm not just preaching here. I'm telling you by example. God put, gave you two pastors that lead by example. You have Pastor Gary, now you got another one. It's not just, it's easy to preach it, but look, you got, I, got to, I got to practice what I preach. And I'm out there. I'm out there knocking on door. Brother Jerry will tell you, I'm out there a lot of hours, and I'm out there inviting people and talking to them about Jesus and inviting them to the Lord's house. In fact, during Easter, when we had Easter Sunday, I was signing up. I took some of those flyers that I gave some of you to sign up, and I signed up. I went over there, and I saw moms with their kids, and I signed up. And by God's grace, we had a mom that came in. And then last, last Sunday, I was able to, by God's grace, to bring another, another visitor. I want to bring visitors. I want to invite people. Well, that's not just a pastor's job. That's your job, too. When was the last time you did that? You have not because you asked not. This is teamwork. Don't leave it all to the pastor. We got to jump in and get involved. So what I'm saying, what are, are we negligence? Are we negligence in our spiritual life? You know, Jesus was talking to the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 2, in, in this church that Jesus was rebuking. By the way, this church, Jesus has no compliment to give. The, there are seven churches he speaks to in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 3. This is one of them that he gave no compliment, zero compliment. Nothing but displeased because of their service. And he calls them, this church of Sardis, a dead church. That's how you start. A dead church. In fact, he, he tells in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Thou hast a name that liveth and are dead. Talking to a dead church. And then he, he tells his dead church in Revelation 3, 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So he says, Whatever, there's, there's still some spark left. There's still something alive left. You better take care of it. You better work on it before that area will die too. And then he says, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. This church was dead. They needed to wake up. And he found their works perfect before God. That word perfect means your works are not completed before God. Look, are we completing the job for God? Or do we have unfinished projects for God? I mean, examine your heart. Are we getting the job done for God? Do we have duties that are not completed? And the reason they did that is because they lack devotion to the Lord to, do the, to complete the job because of their carnal interest was keeping them from completing their spiritual duty for God. Are we like that? Are we putting carnal interest before the most important business, God's business? I mean... Do we have spiritual duties that are not completed? Are we like Abner sleeping? Are we like Abner negligent, careless? 1 Samuel 26, verse 17. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son, David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O King. I want you to notice that how David shows a lot of submission and humility here to Saul. You notice why he calls him? Lord. This guy's trying to kill him. King. You see the submission, the humility of David? I mean, this guy has the heart of God. No wonder he's calling men after God's own heart. This is the way he's treating Saul who's trying to kill him. Verse 18, and she said, wherefore do my Lord thus pursue after his servant? He even called himself, I'm your servant. Lord, my king, you see his humility, his submission? For what have I done? And what evil is in my hand? So he keeps showing mercy to Saul. He keeps proving to Saul that he's not going to harm him. He keeps proving to Saul over and over, I have no malice in my heart towards you. I'm not trying to harm you. Get it through your head, Saul. 
And even by taking the spare from his, you know, that he took his spare and they took the crews of water, that was a, a, a proof, a powerful proof. I'm not trying to hurt you. I don't have hatred in my heart towards you. Well, Saul don't get it. So David strive. I want you to notice here that, I mean, we see David, he's, he's completely trusting the Lord with his life. And, but David also, he, he, he strive to have a clear conscience before God and before man. I mean, he, 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 that's what he's proving. He, he's striving. He wanted to have a clear conscience, not only before God, which he did, because he meant that he had no malice. He proved it many times. But not only he wanted it, he was striving to want to have a clear conscience before God, but also before man, even before Saul and his soldiers that are watching, listening to this conversation. You know that having a clear conscience before God and man is not just an Old Testament saying here. It's not just for the Old Testament. You know, in the New Testament, if you really Google, if you, if you really uh, look for that word conscious in the New Testament, you're going to find that many times in the New Testament, he's always, you know who uses it the most? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul mentions having a, a clear conscience several times during his ministry. And let me read to you in Acts chapter 24, in verse 16, what the Apostle Paul uses it during his ministry. In Acts 24, verse 16, I exercise myself. In other words, he, he strive always to have always a conscious void of offense towards God and towards man. You see, David's conscience was clear before God already when he was talking to Saul, but he wanted to have a clear conscience before people also. And I believe that's a big part for us in the Christian life where we could say my conscience is clear before God and before man. We need to have a clear conscience before God. And before man, we should be able to say, I got none to hide. I'm an open book. I'm an open book. I have nothing to hide. You know, my wife could check my phone anytime. She could check my phone. I don't have a password in my phone. She could read all my texts. She could check everything on my phone, and she's not going to be disappointed. And by the way, because I want to be like that, not only before others, but even before God. And that's what David, that was David's attitude. That should be our attitude. 1 Samuel 26, verse 19. Now therefore, I pray thee, let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred up thee against me, let him accept an offering. So David here says forth two possibilities for why Saul was pursuing him. He gave two possibilities here why Saul was pursuing him. Maybe, in other words, maybe the Lord make you feel this way, uh, Saul, David tells So Maybe the Lord make you feel this, this, this way. Maybe God stir you up, you know, to come after me. And if God is the one who is directing you to come after me, then I sin. Then I accept that I'm wrong, and I'm willing to offer a sin offering for God for atonement for my sin. If I, then I, I'm wrong. I'm willing to, get to, to offer God a sin offering. That was the first possibility, but the second one was in verse 19, but if they be the children of man, cursed be they before the Lord. In other words, but if, if it's not the Lord directing you, maybe it's evil man directing you, maybe it's evil man that put this in your mind, So, If that's the case, then the evil man, they should be cursed, they should be judged. Notice David did not have here a third possibility. He had two possibilities. Two possibilities he had. You know, may, maybe, maybe God's direct. Maybe God stirred you up. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to, to, to make a right with the Lord, I, I, even if I have to offer a, a, a sin offering. But then the second one, he says, maybe it's just evil man. So they, they, they're, they're, they're putting this lies into your mind, and if that is the case, then God's going to judge them. They're going to be judged. But he, David does not use a third possibility, which is your evil, jealous heart was doing it, which is true. He could have said that, but he said, I'm just going to leave that, you know, he's going to leave it up, up to salt, to, to meditate on it. But I want, you to, I want you to see that at the end of verse 19, the thing that really concerned David more 
than any other thing. He says in, in the end of verse 19, and they, and they, talking about the evil man, have driven me out of this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. So what I want you to notice is that the thing that concerned David's heart more than anything else was not that he was inconvenient for him to live in the wilderness or even away from the palace or even away from his wife or even facing some kind of physical hardship. The thing that concerned David more than anything else was that he was driven out from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord. The inheritance of the Lord, I believe, was the land of Israel. That's where the tabernacle was to worship the Lord. And being a fugitive kept him from worshiping at the tabernacle in the land of Israel. So the loss of worship in the tabernacle was a big loss for David. So David's telling Saul, you guys are putting pressure on me to leave the inheritance of the Lord, the land of Israel where the worship of the Lord is in the tabernacle, to go in a land that served all the gods. They're putting pressure on David to leave the land of Israel where the tabernacle was and to go in the land that served other gods. Look at verse 19 again. For they, evil men, have driven me out of, that, out of that, this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. In other words, you guys are pushing me away from the land of Israel to go live with the own golly. So David's greatest pain was being removed from worshiping on the God's presence in the tabernacle with God's people. Now we know that God's presence, David knew that God's presence is everywhere. By the way, God's presence is everywhere. He knew that, that God was with him. But David knew that God chose a specific place in the land of Israel where the tabernacle is, where, uh, where they, uh, they're in the tabernacle, they, uh, the word of God was being taught and proclaimed with the sacrificial system being practiced there, David understood that God was specifically there in the tabernacle. He knew that God designed a place in Israel, in the, land of, to, in the tabernacle, to worship God and to worship on the God's presence with God's people. And David, that's why he was concerned more about that than anything else. And by the way, you know, you know that God is everywhere? He'll never leave us nor forsake us, but you know, God has designed specific places where his presence is there. And you know where? The Lord's house. 1 Timothy 3.15, it says, the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And then in, 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 in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, like we're doing it now, they're in mind the midst of them. And look, I, I know God's presence is with me, and I spend time with him. Everywhere I go, I talk to him. I'm in communion with him. But I look forward for a specific place where God is present here, like the Lord's house. Thank God you're here tonight, amen? Thank God. Most people will complain about material loss before spiritual loss. David is not complaining about no material loss or anything else. He's complaining, man, let me get back to my, to my land. I want to worship God. Let me get back to the tabernacle and worship God. 1 Samuel 26, verse 20. Now therefore, let not my blood fall on the, to the earth before the face of the Lord. So we see that David's cry here is filled with a lot of pain and emotional turmoil. In other words, he says, Saul, please don't kill me. And then he says, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. You know that a flea cannot harm anyone. David's calling himself a flea. A flea cannot harm anywhere. Then he goes out as when one dove hunt a what? A partridge in the mountains. That's interesting, huh? What is a partridge? A par it's a bird. And a bird. And you know, you understand what a partridge, you know, a partridge, they're, they're easy to hunt in the mountains. They're easy to hunt because, yes, they, they could fly, but they tend to stay firmly on the ground unless they're threatened. They, they fly only to escape the predator. So if you see that bird, Brother Jerry, they do fly, but they're, they're not really flying birds. They just fly when they feel threatened and they, they're trying to escape the predator. So they fly a little bit high and then they go back down. And then they fly a little high and then they go back down and then they get tired. 
And what David is saying, so I'm like that patrich in the, in the mountain. You keep trying to hunt me, and I keep escaping, and I'm just tired of running. I'm tired of escaping. Verse 21, then says Saul, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. Notice what he said, I have sinned. Do you believe it? I don't believe it. I don't think David believes it either. I mean, he knows the right words to say, but his heart is not sincere. Because back in 1 Samuel chapter 24, the last time he said, I'm sorry, he said it with tears. He didn't mean it, because he's still after him. I mean, how, how do you deal with a guy like this? How do you deal with a guy like this that's playing games? Well, I know how you, we're supposed to deal. Jesus tells us how to deal with people that act like that. Remember when Peter asked Jesus, if my brother sinned against me? Right? How many times? Seven times or 70 times seven, right? How many times should I forgive him? And what did Jesus say? 70 times seven, 490 times. What does that mean? You keep forgiving. And that's what he was doing. David was keep forgiving him. Even though he didn't mean it, he kept forgiving him. That's, how we, that's the same attitude you and I need to have. He goes on, verse 21, because my soul was precious in thy eyes. This day, behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Don't we play the fool at times? Don't we play the fool, just like Saul? You know, when we stubbornly disobey God, when you, you and I commit presumption sins, when you put yourself, you know, you're going to put yourself in danger of being influenced by demonic influence, just like Saul, and you're going to have a distressing spirit just like Saul. That's playing the fool. He played the fool. He was miserable, but he brought it upon himself. He played the fool. Don't we do the same? Will we stumbling disobey God, do it our own way? And what's the result? A distressing spirit, a discouraged spirit, no joy? When you take sin lightly, like Saul, you play the fool. You know, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. We need to have a holy fear of sin. That's what they, uh, Saul was lacking. We need to have a holy fear of sin. You know, Saul at first was playing with sin, and now we see that he's destroyed by sin. That's how we play the fool. You better take sin seriously like God takes it serious and have a holy fear of sin. You better be obedient to the Lord, not be stubborn, because you'll play the fool just like Saul. Verse 22, and David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it or grab it. He's just trying to play a safe. You can't trust this guy. Verse 23, the Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. Verse 24, and behold, as thy life was much set by this day, in my eyes, so let my life be much said by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of, of tribulation. Now that phrase, much said by there, has the sense to value. What is, his, what is Saul saying? What is David saying? Just like God, look, I value your life. I'm not trying to harm you. I, you know, same way I value your life, God values my life. And then in verse 25 there, Verse 25, the last verse, he says, Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou should both do great things, and also should thou still prevail. Now he admits that he's going to be king, and he's going to prevail. So David went on to his way, and Saul returned to his place. But, you know, let me finish with this. The reason David spared Saul's life is because he wanted God to treat him that way. The same way that David treated Saul, he wanted God to treat him the same way with mercy. With mercy. So, so I want the Lord to be as merciful to me as I am to you. And let me say this. If I, want, if I want, so in other words, if I want God to bless me when I'm king, then I'm going to bless the king right now. If I want God to be merciful to me when I'm king, then I'm going to have to be merciful to the king right now in front of me. 
And let me say this, how much mercy and forgiveness do we want from the Lord? We want big mercy, right? We want big forgiveness. Then we need to give big mercy to others, just like David. You want big mercy? You want big forgiveness? Then you need to give it to others. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for thou shalt obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, right there in Matthew 5, 7, Jesus is not talking about. Jesus was not saying that when you show mercy to someone, 10 out of 10 people that you show mercy, are they going to return mercy to you? That's not what he's saying. Does that work? We try that many times. Does it work? No, people don't appreciate it. You show somebody mercy, they say, that's not mercy. I expected that. You're supposed to do that for me. I deserve that. You got to treat me nice all the time. That's the attitude they give us, right? So, I mean, what Jesus is saying there is when you show mercy to someone else, God will show mercy to you. Amen. David was focused on God's mercy to him. And that's what motivated him to be merciful to Saul. So he was saying to Saul, you know what I'm, you know how I'm treating you, Saul? You know the way I'm treating you with mercy? I'm looking, I'm looking forward for God to treat me with the same mercy that I'm giving you. And David did not have the attitude of many today. If you're kind to me, I'll be kind to you. If you're merciful to me, I'll be merciful to you. That was not David's attitude. And by the way, Thank God that when we don't treat God right, he treats us with mercy. He was having the heart of God, amen? But look, let me finish with this. Matthew chapter 6. Let me give you one more verse. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 12. In Matthew chapter 6 in verse 12. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in verse 12, in Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debts as we forget the debts of others. If you do tonight, if you're a believer in Christ, God has forgiven us a big debt that we own. We, don't, we would have went straight to hell. But because of Jesus dying on the cross, and we accept him as our Savior, he paid the penalty for our sin. Now we don't have to pay it. He paid it for us. Now we're, we're free from going to hell. That's a big debt that we own, Amen. And you know what? Just like he forgave you that big debt, you need to forgive others when they sin against you and sin against me. Amen? Hey, you want big mercy from God? He gives big mercy. Return big mercy. You want big forgiveness? Return big forgiveness. So take a look at your measuring cup tonight of mercy. Take a look at your measuring cup tonight of mercy and, and forgiveness. How, how, how big is your cup? What, you got a little measuring cup? A little measuring cup, you know, that the ones you ladies use to cook, to, to measure your, 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 your season? How's your measuring cup of mercy and forgiveness? Is it a big cup or is it a little cup? Throw it away. Throw it away and get the big cup. Because if you, if you want God to pour out, to use his big cup of mercy, then we need to do the same. Amen? Let's stand on our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, use the message, dear God. I'm done, Lord. The truth went out, Lord. I pray you use it. I pray that it would hit home. And we put it to practice, dear God. That's the truth for us, Lord. We want big mercy? Then give others big mercy. You want big forgiveness? Then give others big forgiveness, Lord. May we, Lord, may, may we put this to practice, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation is open.